It is my great pleasure to introduce to you my friend and colleague, Peter Murray. Thank you very much, uh, Penny. And uh, that was a terrific uh, summary of your work. Um, I like the idea of art for everyone. Um, which is, of course, what we are concerned with at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. Um, and thank you very much for those kind remarks. Uh, I have known Penny for a long time, and uh, we, we, we have worked together on um, several and many, many occasions, actually. Um, it, it is a great pleasure to be here. It's a great pleasure to be back in Philadelphia. It's a long time since I've been here. Um, but uh, I, I have been here quite a few times in the past and uh, admired the work of uh, the Public Art Development Trust. I mean, it's amazing uh, the, the collection you have of public art in Philadelphia. You should be incredibly proud of it. I also think the, uh, the museum, the art gallery, has got a fantastic collection as well. Um, and uh, so it, it, it's, it's terrific to be here, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Um, I'm going to start with this uh, quotation from Lynn Green, who is an English art historian. Nothing like a bit of self-promotion to start with. Um, so I'm not going to read it out. Uh, you know, you, you can read it. Um, but what Lynn was writing about was the Yorkshire Sculpture Park in 2008. And she, of course, was saying what a fantastic place it is, which indeed it is. Um, but she was also pointing out a couple of, um, uh, making a couple of points which I think are very, very, very important. And I want to um, focus on those uh, during the course of uh, my talk uh, this evening. Um, I think that when she talks about the passion for those who created the landscape, that is very important in terms of the Yorkshire Sculpture Park because it is a man-made landscape. You know, it's like the parks you have in Philadelphia, the passion of the people who created those. Without those spaces, you have, uh, you know, you, you, you lose a lot. So I start with the passion of the people who created our landscape. Then the passion of people like me and the staff of the Yorkshire Sculpture Park who brought it all together and have created what is now known as the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. And then, it's not last but not least, the most important thing, the passion of the artist. Without the artist, without the art, we have nothing. So those three passions are very, very important in terms of what we're going to, what I'm going to be talking about um, this evening. Um, the, um, the, the, the title, Natural Affinities, um, I, I, I would like to start with um, a, a more general statement about the landscape and why we place objects in the landscape. That is what I would call the natural affinities between art and landscape, which is the title of the talk. I'm actually starting with a general statement um, about art and landscape. Um, if you like to create the rationale as to why the Yorkshire Sculpture Park uh, exists and why Storm King exists and, and various other projects similar to that. The human desire to make sense of the world through the manipulation and exploration of forms emphasizes that our connection with the environment is paramount. Artists in many parts of the world, from the rolling parklands of Europe to the vast open spaces of North America, have striven in different ways to leave their mark within the landscape. Michael Heiser, found in the western deserts of America, what he described as the unraped, peaceful, religious spaces necessary for his work, as large in scale as some of the religious temples of ancient America. Robert Smithson, um, 
constructed his mesmerizing spiral jetty in the great salt lake of Utah. And Walter de Maria his lighting, chose the deserts of New Mexico for his lightning fields. Contrast the scale of the work of these artists and their approach to landscape with the intimate um, sculpture garden is that Noguchi created in Mur, J Japan, a sanctuary which eventually became his final resting place. Or Ian Hamilton Finlay, Ian Hamilton Finlay's Scottish garden, which encompassed philosophy, history, craft, gardening and landscape design to create what he called Little Sparta. The growth of numerous forms of parks, gardens, and landscape projects devoted to sculpture across many different countries may well be linked to our concern for landscape. In Britain, Henry Moore discovered landscape as a prime location for his sculpture, when in 1953, he cited his bronze sculpture, King and Queen, in the southern highlands of Scotland. In the rugged landscape of Dumfrieshire, king and queen takes on a special air of mystery, a magical presence which springs from the regal dignity and animal vitality of the forms enhanced by the dramatic nature of the context. Moore, who emerged from a moder modernist background and whose work in the late 20s attracted some hostility when he was accused of being a corrupter of youth, a Bolshevik, and a man who had been feeding on garbage, did not create King and Queen for the Scottish landscape. He did, however, become more and more interested in what I call site-related works, sculpture which formed an affinity with the space often generated a new existence for the work and the location, which is what you uh, often do in, uh, in, in Philadelphia. The Scottish experience of 1953 was not only a turning point for Moore, who said, seeing them has convinced me that sculpture, at any rate, my sculpture, is, seen, is best seen in this way and not in a museum but also for the development of contemporary sculpture in the landscape. The thing about Henry Moore's King and Queen in Scotland was it probably was the first piece of contemporary sculpture to be cited uh, in the British landscape. Could be wrong, but I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain uh, that was the case. Mention of Barbara Hepworth earlier. Barbara Hepworth, a contemporary of Moore, who was also born in Yorkshire, became fascinated by landscape and similarly, later in life considered it the ideal setting for her work. In 1970, Hepworth created her most ambitious and complex work, The Family of Man. This multi-part sculpture comprises nine upright figures, each made of two, three, or four stacked elements. The figures can be shown individually or in groups, but to gain an appreciation of Hepworth's vision and intent, the family of man should be seen as a whole and in the open air. For Hepworth, no sculpture really lived until it goes back into the landscape. From her modernist roots in the 1930s, Hepworth eventually found an affinity with the landscape, as can be seen in the, at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, where all nine members of the family are majestically displayed on a hillside only a few miles from Hepworth's birthplace. Um, the other, there's only two sets uh, in the world. One is in Yorkshire, and the, the other is in the Pepsi Cola uh, Sculpture Park, which I, I, I think is not too far from here. Is that, is that right? It's in oh. Westchester, New York. Right, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, there are, hang on, where am I now? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, both Moore and Hepworth went on to create their own sculpture parks in Perry Green, Hertfordshire, and St. Ives Cornwall, respectively, which went far beyond mere display, providing an outdoor studio for the artist 
where they could learn uh, about light, form, and the complexities of making art for the open air. The, um, the Spanish sculptor Eduardo Chulida transformed a disused area of the shoreline of San Sebastian with his sculpture Combs of the Winds into what I consider to be one of the finest examples of public art in Europe. I, to me, this is just a fantastic piece of art because it brings all these natural elements together. But uh, I, I, I want to go on to um, talk about what else uh, Chalida did. Um, apart from creating this wonderful piece of public art, he dreamt of utopia, a space where my sculpture could rest and where people could walk among them as if walking through woods. This dream resulted in Chalida Le Coup, a sculpture park and museum created by the artist outside his hometown of San Sebastian, which consists of a farmhouse converted into a museum with over 40 sculptures sited in 30 acres of landscape, reflecting 50 years of artistic endeavor. It did close down, but my understanding is it, now, it has now reopened. There are many other examples of gardens created by artists providing the public with a greater awareness and understanding of their work. But moving back in time to the 18th century, England experienced what might be described as an early land art movement with the development of the great English parklands and country estates. One of the most famous uh, practitioners was Lancelot Capability Brown, who with others wanted to create a seemingly more natural style of gardens and landscape on a grand scale. This approach was influenced by the ideal, idealized landscapes of 17th century painters, such as um, Poussin and Claude, and based on a growing appreciation of landscape for its own sake. The scale of developing this new landscape, this Arcadian ideal, was quite remarkable. Huge landscape excavation, excavations, villages uprooted and moved, valleys flooded, hills leveled or remodeled, and rivers diverted to enable Brown and others to become masters of the cultivated landscape as they literally rebuilt the landscape. Breton Hall, home of the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, although influenced but not designed by Capability Brown, is one such English, or was one such English country estate. It is richly layered, it is a richly layered, elegant landscape, designed to provide a multiplicity of panorama with vantage points, long views and vistas, all planned to focus the eye. The landscape was conceived as a pleasure garden to generate different moods and experiences and to create a sense of surprise. It was fashioned to please and delight the eye and also challenge the mind and like a great work of art, only gradually reveals, uh, reveals its content and form. These qualities and many more continue to influence the sighting of sculpture and the organization of exhibitions to, cre to create what is now known as the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. Now, some of the points I've made there, um, I'd like us to try and reflect on them when, excuse me, when I start to show you some examples of work at, at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. Just a little bit of background about the um, Yorkshire Sculpture Park, I'll save that. <laughs> save that one. <laughs> Needs a bit of explanation, that one. <laughs> in 1948-1949, um, 1949, the Breton estate, which you're looking at now, was split up and part of it, including the mansion, which you can see, became Breton Hall College of the Arts, uh, linked to the University of Leeds. In the 1970s, I was appointed to the academic staff 
of the college as head of postgraduate studies in art education. And for a variety of reasons, I had the idea of placing sculpture in the grounds. And as a result, the Yorkshire Sculpture Park was established in 1977 as the first permanent sculpture park in Britain. At that time, there was little support for contemporary sculpture. The grounds of Bretton Hall were closed to the public, and the move from private to open access raised many difficulties. There was no audience or public support, no staff and a one-off grant of £1,000 from the Regional Art Board. From there, YSP has evolved slowly. Time was needed to understand the landscape, to learn about um, and discover new spaces. More land was acquired, gradually creating new experiences and opportunities for the public and artists. The college has now gone, and YSP has succeeded in reuniting the Breton estate, which since 1949 had been divided into different ownerships, providing public access to approximately uh, 500 acres, which I think is about 202 hectares of historic landscape. YSP has created um, substantial employment, undertaken major capital investment, contributed significantly to the economy and culture of the re region, and worked with hundreds of artists from Britain and many other countries, and established a national and international reputation. But this is what it was like in 1977. Uh, I'm the one without the glasses, <laughs> uh, with some hair. You can see the hair there. And uh, this is... Um, we, th this is with a, a friend who has now sadly died, Michael Lyons, a sculptor from Britain, and we are just looking at this piece of sculpture and wondering how we managed to get it there, because uh, in those days we didn't have any equipment at all, and we, we you know, we'd physically, I, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure how we managed to get it into that position actually, but it, it was really, really difficult uh, in the early days. Um, but we, we were very lucky that we had the support uh, from the outset of people like Henry Moore. Henry Moore, um, I wrote to him and I was surprised, well, he didn't write back, which didn't surprise me, but what I was surprised about was he telephoned me and uh, said, you know, Henry Moore here. And I thought he was one of my colleagues um, uh, having, you know, uh, having a prank. Um, and uh, he said, I've got your letter. Um, I'm coming up to Yorkshire. I'll call in and see you. So he came, and that, that's me, again, with hair, and uh, Henry Moore, and Henry Moore's daughter, Mary Moore. And Henry Moore became our founding patron and gave us some money immediately, and also um, we, he, 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 he loaned some work to the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. So, you know, we, we got that support from very, very early on. Um, we also got support from Anthony Carroll, um, Sir Anthony Carroll, major, major British artist. Uh, and you can see here Tony's promenade. Uh, it also gives you an idea of the landscape we've got. Very different. If you look at the first part there, that's quite a formal area. This is quite open. And you can see Tony's promenade. And under the trees, you can see a sculpture by Richard Serra. Very unusual sculpture because it was m by Serra because it was made of stone. But, um, you know, we, as I say, we, we, we got support from a, a lot of um, artists and important people in the early days. Um, Magdalene Abakanovic, um, she, we, we had a major exhibition of Magdalene Abakanovic in 1994. Um, and um, what else did we have? And, th and this is the quote from um, William Packer, uh, who was the... Um, uh, he used to be the, um, uh, the, the art critic for the Financial Times. And uh, in 2009, he said, it's now perhaps the finest exhibition site for sculpture in the world. Whether that's true or not, I'm not quite sure. Um, but when we're citing sculpture at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, we try to avoid clutter. One of the things about the historic landscape is the way the capability Brown did not want clutter. He wanted 
large spaces, large shapes. And we tried, we tried to, is that it? <laughs> Don't know what happened there. <laughs> I don't think that's me. <laughs> um, well, after that musical, after that musical interlude. <laughs> um, so, um, just to, you know, we, 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 we try to avoid clutter. We try to give sculpture as much space as possible. And you can see from this image the way this piece by Henry Moore takes on the whole of the landscape. One of the things about uh, sculpture in the landscape, Tony Carroll used to say that what sculpture needs, it doesn't necessarily need to be big. It needs three things. It needs scale, scale, and scale. <laughs> and if you look at this Henry Moore here, you can see it's got you know, it, the scale is really quite, quite wonderful. So, moving on. Uh, inevitably, evolving from an 18th century pleasure garden created for a privileged minority um, to public access required major changes. But we have always been motivated by the spirit of this rich, richly layered landscape. The imprint of time, the innovation and toil of previous centuries, the constant interaction with nature and our desire to leave a positive mark imbuing an historic past with a rejuvenated existence, a new landscape. Artists continue to make an enormous contribution to the practical, aesthetic, and philosophical evolution uh, of Yorkshire Sculpture Park. And one of the first things we did was to organize artists in residencies. So more or less from year one, um, you know, we, we, we created residencies and fellowships for artists. And we always have an artist working on site, uh, doing various things. And uh, it's, it's useful just to reflect and have a look at some of the uh, artists that we have worked with. This is in 1987, the young Andy Goldsworthy. Um, this is, um, the, the artists don't necessarily have to be visual artists. This is Simon Armitage. Uh, British poet, um, who uh, you know we we he had a residency with in 2007, and he did what he called a poetry trail, where he went round the landscape, writing poetry in different locations and reading poetry in different locations. And here we have um, Simon Whitehead, um, who was a performance artist, and whose walks to illuminate invited members of the public to harvest so solar energy as they journeyed round the landscape, which in turn powered light shoes, enabling illuminated walks around the landscape in the dark of night. You can see the, the shoes there, and there's someone walking around, you know, uh, charging the batteries, as it were. Uh, this is Rebecca Chesney, who brought bees back to the Yorkshire Sculpture Park, and we now actually uh, produce our own honey. This is a very, very young student from the Royal College of Art, just finished at the Royal College of Art, who actually is knitting uh, as part of his residency. This is a very interesting one. Um, this is uh, Katrina Palmer, and uh, what this is, it's, it was a residency, but it's a piece of sculpture, so the jump is actually a piece of sculpture. But it is activated uh, a couple of times a week by a horse and rider jumping over it. And what it is, is uh, it, it was a memorial um, to commemorate the bravery of women in the First World War. Um, it's a group called the First Aid Nursing uh, Yeomanry. Short, the, the, the short title is Fannies. And they would ride into battle uh, to save wounded soldiers and then, you know, treat them or, or bring them back. And this, uh, you can't really read the, uh, the quotation on there, but it's from the diary of one of the, uh, you know, the participants. And twice, uh, several times a week, you know, the, 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 the art is activated by the, uh, by the rider. So, and, it, and, and also, Breton is quite famous for horse riding as well, you know, so the two things really go together extremely well. Um, 
We have a collection and works on loan, and we'll have a quick look at them. Anthony Gormley, again, it gives you an idea of the landscape we have. Um, this is um, Anthony's uh, field for the British Isles. We've converted one of the old barns into an exhibition space, and you can see the installation there. Um, this is Richard Long, British, a very famous British artist. Uh, we have a piece by Richard on loan. We also have worked with Richard on exhibitions. This is by a younger artist, Peter Liversidge. Uh, everything is connected. We think that is incredibly important, uh, you know, an important statement. I mean, it's an important uh, piece of work and an interesting uh, media to work in uh, in our landscape, but a very, very interesting statement. We have this piece by Sol LeWitt. Um, this goes back a long way when Sol LeWitt was still alive. He, um, he had an exhibition in Leeds and he visited the YSP, was very, very interested in making this piece. And uh, this was in the days of fax machines. Uh, and so he sent us a, a, a drawing uh, on, a, you know, on a fax machine in terms of how we should make it. Um, this is by Dennis Oppenheim. Dennis Hoppenheim, uh, during his life, visited the YSP, and this is a group of his uh, trees which have been gifted to us. Barry Flanagan, who now is sadly dead, we worked with Barry on many, many occasions. Uh, this is by Elizabeth Frink. You may not know Elizabeth Frink, um, but um, she was a very, well, she, she was a very important British artist who died, um, sadly, you know, quite some time ago. And we had a very close connection with her. And we've, we've inherited from the estate a large body of her work. And these are, these are called the Riachi figures. And they're based on a couple of things, really. One is some Riachi warriors um, that were discovered off the coast of Italy. Um, and uh, they, 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 they're actually Greek. Uh, they, they, the originals were, were, were Greek statues. But also, um, Liz visited Australia and was fascinated by Aborigine art, and so the two things came together. But she's, she's a really fascinating artist, and um, one of the... She was much more interested in men than women, uh, you know, in terms of her sculpture. Nearly all of her sculpture is based on men. And some of them, uh, there's a tremendous sort of sense of vulnerability in... In, in, in the work. Some of them look incredibly aggressive and some of them, you know, look much more sensitive and vulnerable. And she talked about thuggishness. She said she had a preoccupation or thuggishness was a preoccupation of hers at one time. And you can sort of see this uh, in this particular group. Then we have uh, Jonathan uh, Borowski. We have this uh, molecular man by Jonathan. This is an interesting one because if you look at the way we've taken this photograph, uh, we've taken this image to illustrate how we open up spaces. So the trees here are, if you like, the walls of the gallery. By placing the sculpture in the middle of those trees, it enhances the space. It makes people much more aware of the space between the trees. The lifeblood of the Yorkshire Sculpture Park exhibitions that's what we stand for more than anything else. And in some ways, it's a crazy thing to do because to actually organize exhibitions in the open air is a bit of a nightmare. Uh, first of all, it's expensive and physically it's very, very demanding. But it's something we do and it's something we're very, very interested in and we've developed a curatorial tradition for this type of work. And this is Joel Shapiro who took over the formal garden and Joel's work um, you know, if you don't get it right, it, uh, it loses, it loses so much. And here, what we did was we treated this exhibition, we treated the garden as a sort of dance area, as a stage, and we choreographed the exhibition. So these figures are sort of floating or dancing, if you like, across the, uh, across the lawn. Um, I just think I, I just thought you'd like to see some of the facilities we've built over the years. We have a visitor center here, which had terrific coffee and wonderful food and a marvelous shop. 
uh, we developed uh, an old indoor uh, riding arena into an exhibition space, and this is Andy Goldsworthy. Um, this is our underground gallery. We've built an underground gallery, and this is a, an early exhibition in 2005 of William Turnbull. And in 2008, we organized probably one of the largest exhibitions of Noguchi ever. Uh, and it was indoor and outdoor, and it was a fantastic exhibition. To me, Noguchi is still incredibly underrated in, uh, in Europe. I think he's one of the great, great sculptors. Uh, and uh, this, was, this was such an uh, such a incredibly uh, moving and powerful statement. Another artist we worked, well, not we didn't actually work with Miro, uh, but we worked with the family, um, and uh, we, we, we organized a huge Miro exhibition. And uh, we, we now, as a result of that, we've got quite a group of Miros at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. But this is the indoor, and one of the things about our indoor gallery is the indoor-outdoor. Very, very important when we're organizing exhibitions. So that's the outdoor, and that's the indoor of the Miro. Um, exhibition. One of the um, one of the artists that we've uh, worked with uh, quite a bit is um, is uh, um, Plenza, Jama Plenza. And I was just trying to find a quote actually um, from him. Oh, here we go. Um, Jama Plenza, who we've known for years, and uh, he, um, this is a, an exhibition. Again, it's that sort of indoor and outdoor. If you just bear with me. Oops, wrong way. Uh, this is the outdoor, and that's the indoor. And you can see the sort of contrast between the two. And what we, what we did here with, um, for, for JAMA, um, with the outdoor, we actually placed these heads on the roof of the underground gallery. So again, it gives you an idea of how we treat the landscape. This, is, this grass that you can see where the heads are placed on is the roof of our underground gallery. So it doesn't interfere with the landscape at all. It's like a pencil mark on the landscape. And placing these heads on there brings the landscape into the heads, and it takes the landscape, uh, sorry, it takes the heads into, into the landscape. You know? So that sort of interaction there works wonderfully well. And to me, that is one of, one of the best installations uh, we, 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 we ever did, actually. It was, it was amazing, absolutely amazing. So that's Jama Plenza. And then, oh, no, yes, and then we have a Jama Plenza on, on loan, and you can see where we cited this. We, we're gradually opening up areas of the sculpture park, and this was the first time we'd ever actually placed a sculpture on the other side of the lake. Tony Cragg, um, Tony Cragg is a really good friend um, of, of ours and of the Sculpture Park. And um, we organized a major, major exhibition of Tony's work. And um, this is, uh, this is uh, you know, part of that exhibition. Um, Tony sees himself as a radical materialist. And uh, his, his, his interest in making his interest in constructing is just unbelievable. He's got a huge studio um, with a very, very large group of staff uh, in Germany. Ai Weiwei, we, um, we, we've worked with Ai Weiwei on a couple of occasions, and you can see the indoor installation um, of our chapel. Another thing we do at the YSP is we take historic buildings. There's not that many, but we, we, you know, the few we have. We take them and we restore them, and then we turn them into indoor exhibition spaces. So this chapel we restored, and you can see the indoor Ai Weiwei, and you can see the iron tree uh, outside, of, outside of the chapel. This is um, an installation we have at the moment by Ai Weiwei. You may have seen this. It might have passed through Philadelphia. Uh, it's certainly been in New York. And uh, the whole idea behind this piece was Ai Weiwei wanted it to tour the world. And uh, it's, it, it did eventually get to Yorkshire, and it's with us at the moment, the Zodiac Heads. Cause, 
Uh, another American artist uh, who lives in uh, Brooklyn, um, we gave, caused the first British exhibition, and uh, here you can see um, you know, some of his uh, sculptures in our landscape, and there's another one. I'm just going through these very, very quickly now. Again, the indoor-outdoor, that's the indoor and that's the outdoor. Um, who have we got? Oh, Alfredo, Alfredo Jar. Uh, a very, very moving, powerful political exhibition we organized in 2017. Um, and then, of course, Ursula, Ursula Reidensfraud, um, who I've known for a long, long time uh, and worked with her on many occasions. And in, uh, when was it, uh, four or five years ago, we organized this huge exhibition of her work at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. Now I haven't been to the museum yet, but do you have this? Do you have this piece of the museum as well? Okay. Well, this was made for the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. This piece, <laughs> and it was shown at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park long before I came to Philadelphia. <laughs> um, and this was such a major, major achievement for Ursula and for us. It was just getting finished as it arrived. In fact, I don't think it was finished. Uh, we were still fiddling around with the lighting. But you can see there how it works in the Yorkshire Sculpture Bar. It really is a fantastic uh, piece. One of the great things I think about Ursula's work is the way it absorbs environments, the way that you know, her work really, really looks at home in an urban environment in, in Brooklyn um, or in the 18th century landscape. And I'm sure it looked terrific. We'll, we'll see it tomorrow. I'm sure it looked terrific in, in Philadelphia. <coughs> Um, but there, again, you can see her work in the formality. There you've got it. it it's, it's a pity you can't see more of the landscape, but here you've got it right against the uh, huge uh, panorama of, of Yorkshire, and here you get it in the formal uh, space. With Ursula's show, we took, it to, um, we took part of it to Venice for the Biennale, and we developed a wonderful... Uh, garden in Venice, and here you can see it in 2015. It was one of it was voted. It was in the top three uh, exhibitions voted in the top three exhibitions of the of the Biennale. There you can see it again. Terrific. Ha! Brings back memories. And uh, we've just finished Giuseppe Pannoni, uh, who is a fantastic. I'm sure you know Giuseppe's work. But what we've done at the Yorkshire Sculpture Park is we've put together an indoor-outdoor exhibition which covers about 50 years of his work. And here you can see this tree which has been split down the middle. Um, and there's the outdoor part, uh, or part of the outdoor of the exhibition. So again, you get that sort of indoor. And the whole, more or less the whole exhibition is to do with trees. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? Ha. Huh. Crikey. And one of, the, one of the things I come back to, which I was talking about at the beginning, um, you know, about the way you actually use the landscape. We discover the landscape. We discover the landscape with the artist. And here, look at the amount of space we've given to Giuseppe's piece. Uh, and it deserves it. Education, learning, very, very important. I haven't got time to go into it, but we get 50,000 children coming through the Yorkshire Sculpture Park every year. We run workshops, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just gonna finish off with some site-specific. It took us a long time to get around to site-specific. I always, when we first started, we were pestered by people saying, you should do site-specific work. Site-specific, site-specific, site-specific. Now, the thing about doing a site-specific piece, is like putting a building up. Once you've done it, it's there forever. So you've really, 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 really got to know what you're doing. And you've really got to be very, very confident in that. So I think there are three things, the site-specific, the site-related, and the site-motivated. Um, and um, we, um, we've only, we only started in 2006, really, looking at site-specific. And we worked with James, James Turrell, where we converted this deer shelter into one of his sky spaces. So again, it's the, it's the old and the new coming together. And that's what it's like inside. So there you go. Uh, 
It's fantastic. Then David Nash, um, who um, we've worked with for years, he actually charred these steps on site. Now, this is a site-specific. I think there are 77 steps. And they're made of oak, and they're charred on site, and then they have several tons of coal um, scattered around them because the wealth of Breton was, was based on coal. Uh, this is a functional work of art. And there's another functional work of art by Andy Goldsworthy where he worked with the farmer on our land um, to create the sheepfold. And a couple of times a year, the farmer actually uses it. For the rest of the year, it's just empty for the public to enjoy and look at. Again, another functional work of art. This is a site-specific piece by Andy Goldsworthy where he converted part of the dilapidated ha-ha uh, into this sculpture, which was made from trees taken from our landscape and stone from our landscape. And there you can see it from above. So, you know, although it, it is a powerful piece, it hardly touches the landscape. It hardly touches it. This is by Sean Scully, um, and uh, I think it's a 1,000 tonnes of stone uh, Sean used, or we. Uh, Sean didn't use the stone. Sean thought about it, and we used the stone. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, and, it, and it's from a, from a local quarry. It's an amazing piece. I'm sorry we haven't got time to dwell on it. This is another piece by Sean Scully. I'm sure you know his work, but he's a painter, really, and he's only over the last 10 years that he started to make sculpture. This is um, just, uh, it's not, not only our security, this. Um, this is to do with the way we look after the landscape. So farming and agriculture is very important in our landscape. And we work with the farmers, and we have cattle uh, in parts of the landscape. Um, just to finish off by a couple of things we've been concerned with recently, we just opened a new building. And this is uh, some shots of the building before it opened. Uh, we, we, were just getting, we were just getting ready to open. And there you can see it. And going back to what I was saying at the beginning about vistas, the, one of the reasons we've opened, we built this was, first of all, to create more space for eating and a, a small gallery, but also to create a different view of the landscape. So from here, you get a totally different vista of the landscape. And it's a very light and a very, very airy building. And there you are. Uh, and uh, when you, when you, and you can see, if you, you can see there, you can see the lake. Can you see it in the, in the distance? So this is the only spot in, in the Yorkshire Sculpture Park where you stand there, you can actually see, see the lakes. And again, to contrast, uh, you know, a big contrast in terms of what we're doing, we're just getting ready for the summer and we're installing Damien Hurst. And this is uh, the installation of Damien's, I think it's a 13, is it 13 meters or 17 meters? I can't remember now, but it's very big. Um, this sculpture by Damien Hurst going in the 18th century landscape. It's creating a lot of controversy, a lot of interest. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but to a certain extent, that's what art is about. It isn't all about, you know, just, uh, passing by and saying, oh, that's nice. Uh, you know, um, and, and here we have Damien's um, installation contrasting with David Smith, which is going to be our summer exhibition. So those two things, you know, will be existing side by side. And um, I just finished with this, uh, with this quote from, um, um, from the judges of the Museum of the Year where they're saying we are a truly outstanding museum with a bold artistic vision, cons consistently delivered at the highest level. Um, that's what we try to do. You know, we very much like the art trust here. We want to create real quality for people to enjoy and people to participate in. Um, the way we do it is slightly different because we have a 18th century landscape to look after we have half a million visitors to look after, and um, you know it, 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 it takes some doing. Um, but um, by bringing staff together who have skills in landscape design, in uh, gardening, 
curatorial skills, catering skills, and artists, um, we do try to deliver what, uh, what the judges um, have said here, a bold artistic vision constantly delivered at a high level. And I hope you get a chance to come and visit. Many thanks.